There are a lot of reasons why modern music is so uninspiring, derivative and forgettable. Corporate machines latching onto and just as quickly discarding popular stars on social media. The fact that practically anyone with $500 can download enough software to drive their own home studio. Presets and samples allowing people with no idea how to play an instrument the means to release whole albums. And the fact that a lot of people don't bother to hone their skills in front of audiences. Most of all, modern musical culture is so empty because it lacks the one thing that defined great transformational periods of music for centuries one-upmanship and rivalry among young men. Most people haven't heard of the composer Salieri, and there's a good reason why. His main rival was a young protege named Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Mozart outshone his great rival on the way to becoming a star, playing dazzling pieces on the harpsichord to impress potential patrons, and even playing Salieri's pieces with more flair than their composer as a means of upstaging him. So fierce was the competition in the classical age, so crucial the tussles over the use of concert halls, that some composers were driven to depression and nervous breakdowns. When most people picture Beethoven, they envisage the grim, scowling virtuoso in his later years. But when Beethoven arrived in Vienna as a young pianist, he was savvy, engaged, even charming. Upcoming musicians would spar in the halls and drawing rooms of the city, each player having to improvise on a well-known piece of music. Within a few years, Beethoven was wildly popular as the city's best improviser. To maintain his stature, he had to see off every rival, among them the heavyweights of the music scene. Beethoven was proud of his reputation and defended it against all comers. The competition sharpened his talent. It also sharpened the interest of the young ladies in the corners of these private concert rooms, who would be disporting themselves in their silk dresses, their faces powdered, peering at the young performers from behind their lightly waving fans. In New Orleans in the early 1900s, piano battles had made or broken careers. In the sweltering, smoky, after-dark club world, pianists had to hustle and win over an audience faster than their rivals. Competitors often had criminal records, so confrontations were fierce, with an undercurrent of intimidation and violence. Press agents and magazine spreads were unheard of. Contenders had to be sharp, or lose their prestige, and with it future jobs and engagements. The news would spread like wildfire when a king was toppled off his throne. In the 50s, the best of the raw, ambitious musicians toured through Canada, travelling hundreds of miles across vast distances between little cities and towns, the roadbed eaten by permafrost. Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash had begun the tour as headliners. Jerry Lee Lewis, the newcomer, the blonde-haired kid who called himself the killer, had the nerve to suggest, as the days wore on, that he should close the shows. Through force of will, Lewis climbed up the bill over Carl Perkins until there was only Johnny Cash above him. Lewis's shows got wilder and the audiences bellowed for encores. By the time he had bashed out the last piano chords each night, the people were out of their seats and the local police on edge. Eventually, he fought his way to the top of the bill. The night of his raucous triumph, he walked past Johnny Cash. Nobody follows the killer, he said over his shoulder. In the 60s, rock musicians were incessantly stealing each other's girlfriends. The Beatles and the Beach Boys were constantly trying to up one another, adding more progressive layers of production and melodic innovations to their music. Paul McCartney, visiting California, sat down next to Brian Wilson at a piano, played She's Leaving Home to show the new direction the Beatles were headed. With a smile, he warned his rival, you'd better hurry up.
Jimi Hendrix and The Who had their sets scheduled back to back to end the 1967 Monterey Festival. There was a quarrel backstage. Neither wanted to follow the other. Eventually, The Who went first. Hendrix followed, and having learned through his years coming up what a musician had to do to follow a major act, he pulled out all the stops. He whipped the crowd into a frenzy. The performance entered the annals of rock history. In the East Coast hip-hop scene in the late 1970s, up-and-coming rappers gained their fame through live battles with other MCs. The bigger the audience response, the better the rapper. In the 1980s, rap battles defined careers, and their results would reverberate through all of hip-hop. Musical culture was great in earlier generations because it was rough, competitive, high stakes, a mixture of beautiful craft and ego and urgency and vanity and sensitivity and one-upmanship. Ecstatic tantrums of sexuality, of drugs and sweat, of lithe, volatile, young male energy. These days, not so much. <laughs> 